Good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Amen? Amen. Amen. Yes, and I want to wish everybody a happy new year. And I pray that you had a good evening last night. If you if you stayed up and celebrated, uh, and I hope it was good. If you decided to sleep, I hope you had a good night's rest. But it's good to be here this morning. It's good to be in the house of the Lord and to serve and worship the Lord. And look, I'm looking forward to this year. I look forward to every year. I think we all do, right? We just there's an expectation about a new year, about things changing and coming along. And so I just pray that, um, that you know, 2023 will, will be a great year for each and every one of us, uh, especially in the Lord. Now this morning, I'm going to share from Psalm 19. I put 1 through 14 up here, but I changed it at the last minute to just verses 7 through 14. So um, if you would stand with me this morning as I <clears throat> read the word of God. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules, uh, the rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, much more than fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned, and keeping them there is a great reward. Who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Father, I thank you for this word. I pray that it would go forth this morning in the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Speak to us today, Lord. Let us hear your voice. Guide us, Lord, and I pray that as this last verse says here, that this would be our prayer today, that the words of our mouth, the meditations of our heart would be pleasing and acceptable to you, Father. Because why? You are our rock. You are our redeemer. And without you, we are nothing. Bless this word in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So, again, Happy New Year. By the grace of God, we've made it to another one. Amen. Amen. Yes. As I thought about what the Lord would desire for me to share this week, I, I could not help but consider how God has led me through the peaks and valleys of life. I didn't stop to think about how I arrived at these places, and I realized that while God continues to be with me, many of my struggles were the result of struggling in my own obedience to Him. While we while my joys came from staying true to his law and to his words. And that's why that last verse to me is, I think, so significant. Because the idea here of the med our meditations, the, uh, the, what we think about, what we meditate on, what we, what, where we ponder, where we focus our energy, I think, impacts us greatly. In this morning's psalm, King David shares of the joy of walking in the law of the Lord. For when he does so, he finds his soul is revived, bringing wisdom and joy to those who follow him. What was true for David is also true for each and every one of us as well. For God's word and all that it contains are perfect and serve to effectively guide us in life. We talked about that this morning. We're going to get into that more next week in Sunday school. I don't know if some of you that were in, class, in Sunday school this morning noticed with the handout for Psalm 119, but a lot of the same key words that were in those first eight verses of Psalm 119 appear here. Okay, I think God's trying to make a point to us here. I think it's something that we need to keep in mind. All right? What was true of David is true for us. What is it about God's law then? Because this is really a, a, a psalm that focuses on the law of God, just like Psalm 119, which... Um, uh, for those of you that are listening, I've challenged, or not challenged, or I've, I asked our church to take, and I made a little handout here for any that weren't in Sunday school this morning. You can pick it up afterwards. We've broken down Psalm 119 to 
22 weekdays in the month of January. One for every letter of the Hebrew alphabet, which Psalm 119 is an acrostic, so every eight verses is what deals with one letter of the alphabet. So we're going to read through that, not just read, but meditate. I think that's what's important for us to realize through the meditations, the, the prayer, the thought of all of this. We're so quick. As I shared when I do my Bible reading program, I usually get Psalm 119 broken up into two days, not 22. And we tend to kind of, you know, barrel through or rifle through things like this. And I want us to take some time to think about, you know, um, our relationship with God, our relationship with Jesus Christ, and really our relationship also with the Word and prayerfully approaching the Word. But what is it about God's law, His Word, that obedience to it serves to guide our lives? Uh, let's, I want to consider this morning three things about this law that I, I think can better help us in our service to Him and help us in living our lives. We live in a world today where, uh, you know, we talk about truth being relative, but you know what? I think even more so, and I think this is important for us to understand, language is relative. Instead of approaching God's word or approaching this as, as, as if it's fact, it's left open to the reader to interpret its meaning. And yet, if I'm not careful and I approach it in such a way that speaks to me, apart from how God wants to speak to me, then I'm the one that's an error. We must focus on who he is and what he's trying to tell us here, what he desires to bring to our lives, not what we want to choose to bring into our lives. And I'll probably be building on this more over the next several weeks, but I want to kind of lay this foundation. Now, about the law. Okay, when we talk about biblical law, we, we get into a lot of discussions about, okay, the grace of God, the love of Jesus, and all these things. And yes, those are very important elements in our life. But God's grace does not negate God's law. Again, as I share in Sunday school, we know this in Sunday school, sometimes you get, you get double, but maybe that's good. I don't know. Okay? I just finished reading the book of Revelation, and I'm thinking to myself, there are many that will be condemned because they refuse to accept Jesus Christ. So where does this condemnation come from, except from their unwillingness to walk in obedience to God's law and accept Jesus Christ as Savior? Because Jesus came to fulfill that law. And so when I'm talking law this morning, and you're thinking to yourself, well, I'm not under the law. You're under the law. But by the grace of God and the love of Jesus Christ, you can overcome the law, but not by your own power. And how hard is it for us to keep the law? Hey, many of them, many out there can't even stop at a red light. Okay? If you can't stop at a red light, how in the world do you think you're going to be able to walk with God? Think about that. Something as simple as saying, that means I need to stop here now. And it only affects a moment in time. If you can't do that, how in the world are you going to live for eternity? So I'm going to talk about that, but when I'm talking about the law, I'm talking about also the Word of God. The Word that speaks to us through Jesus Christ. And there are three things that I think that the psalmist gives us here that we want to look at. There's so much more. I mean, the first uh, six verses really deal with nature. And we're, we're going to get into that, but how nature, you know, God sh he reveals himself through nature, and he reveals himself through the law. And, and Paul talks about this as well, those things that are seen, those things that are unseen. But we're not going to get into that today. Just let me know. If you want to do, go a little further, do a little deeper study, it's out there, right? It's out there. So when I talk about the law, I'm also talking about the grace of God uh, through his word that's extended to us. Because we walk in obedience to the, to the law of God, but also to the word of God. So what do we see here? The first thing we see is, is the law is perfect. The law is perfect. Now, as I was doing my research here, and I was thinking about this this week, and spending time uh, you know, looking through things and all this, I thought to myself, what does it mean that the law is perfect? What are we saying here? 
Okay, so the law is perfect. Now, I can never walk in perfection, so why bother? And I've heard people say, well, I, just, I can't do that, so why even bother trying? That's so ridiculous. Because, yes, we're not perfect. But when we say the law is perfect, what we're not talking about is how the law affects us. We're talking about the integrity of God. Because God is perfect. His law is made perfect not through us, but through him. It is his integrity that we're talking about here. When he, when he laid down the law, when he gave us the law, it was not to tell us, you know, not to show us our shortcomings and things like that as much as it was to tell us this is who he is. So when he says, you shall have no other God before me, it's because all other gods are imperfect. Okay? There's only one perfect God. And throughout Scripture, we see the integrity of this God as it comes forth. The testimony of Scripture speaks to us, offering wisdom to all who seek it to better understand God. You see, we, we without him, and there are many out there today who are struggling to understand God because they, they choose not to accept his perfection. They choose not to accept his truth. They want to relativize everything there is to say about scripture and about God. They want to pick and choose what is and what is not. What they want to accept and what they don't want to accept. And yet if we understand that, that God is perfect, if we understand his integrity, then we begin to think about his attributes. The fact that God can't lie to us. Because God is truth. That God cannot hate us. And I've heard Christians and others say that. Well, God just hates me. God can't hate you. Because God is love. But God is also righteous. And in, in his righteousness, we find integrity. Okay? So he wants us to live in, in a relationship with someone who, who is righteous and understands who we are. And through Jesus Christ, is willing to accept us even with all of our faults. The law of God makes the believer complete and blameless in his sight. But it makes us complete and blameless only when we have a right relationship, a born-again relationship with Jesus Christ. Law-keeping is impossible without Jesus. And how do we know this? And how do we get to that point? Through the inworking of the Holy Spirit. It's the Spirit that reveals our shortcomings. It's the Spirit that, that shows us that we need to make a change in our lives and accept Jesus Christ as Savior. So the law is perfect. You might, you know, you might think, well, it's got its faults, it's got its problems, it's this and that, but you know what? It's it's perfect. And and, uh, and God has given it to us as a sign to us of what we must do if we're to have a relationship with him. Is it possible to keep the law in perfection? Not for us because we are imperfect. But because of the perfect God, he's willing to, he has made a way to, for us to enter into that relationship with him through Jesus Christ. So the law is perfect. But more than, in addition to that, the law is pure. While the law, perfection of the law talks about God's integrity, the purity of the law talks about his morality. The idea of the morality of God, when we talk about the purity of the law, when we talk about what God has given us, you know, when we think law, we think Ten Commandments. Okay? I want to go beyond that. I want to go beyond anything that God's word gives us that, that directs our lifestyle, that guides us in how we should live for him and live for Jesus Christ. If these other, these other scriptures that kind of direct the way we should live are not just arbitrarily put in there. As a matter of fact, if you want to go back and really do a study, I think of much of what we see in the word of God in this word right here connects back to those Ten Commandments and whatever else God has given us. So understand what, what the Word of God is saying here, all of it. That's why I said law and word. I want to I I encompass it into the whole Bible, into our relationship. You know, my challenge for each and every one of us this year is that we would get deeper into God's Word. 
that we would spend more time uh, in, in his in this word, not just reading it. It's 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 good to read through the Bible in a year. There's nothing wrong with that. If it takes you five years, there's nothing wrong with that either. But again, let's not do it. Let's not approach this in such a way that I'm going to put a gold star on my wall or a feather in my cap because I accomplished a task and yet not have a relationship with God because I'm just reading it and not spending time understanding who he is. When he's talking about God's integrity, it's found in these pages. We see his integrity. We see his morality. We see his desire to, uh, to have a relationship. But yet we also see his righteousness and the fact that there are times when he will judge us because of our unwillingness to accept his son or to accept his truth or to accept his law in our lives. We mock him by thinking that he's going to overextend his grace to us in such a way that I don't have to worry. Because God is love. And He is love. He is love. And yet, day is coming when those who walk around mocking God and talking about His love and His grace will stand before their Lord and Savior and be judged for their unwillingness to live for Jesus Christ. And how do we know how to live? By reading, studying. Meditating on this word. Not just skimming the pages, not just checking off another box on a read through the Bible program or something like that. The commandment of Scripture speaks to us, revealing God's precepts to all who receive them. He speaks to us through this. This word, it, it, it's God's revelation. It's his manual for living. And I'll tell you, I've spoken with people today uh, on numerous occasions that will take this word and they will, and usually these people don't like this word, but I'm going to use it anyway. Because I believe it's true. They deconstruct the truth of God and reform it into their life. This is what it needs to say for me so that I can live a guiltless life. Well, you know what? Sometimes a little guilt's not a bad thing. Especially if we're dishonoring God. The day is coming. Again, when we will all stand before our Lord and Savior. And he will separate the sheep and the goats. He will say, depart from you you who did these things because you did not know me. We fed the hungry. We, we healed the sick. Those are wonderful things. And, and the body of Christ should be doing all of these things. But who, for whose reason are you doing it? Are you doing it so that the world can see how wonderful you are or because you have a born again love relationship with Jesus Christ that extends that love to others? The law of God purifies the heart of the believer, making one righteous, making one uh, uh, pure in, in God's sight. And I say that because you know what? I love Jesus, and, and I have a relationship with Jesus Christ, and I thank God that, that he allowed me the opportunity to receive Jesus Christ as my Savior years ago. And before God's sight, I'm pure. But in this world, I still deal with impurities. I still struggle with things in my life, as we all do, because none of us are perfect. But thank God, through Jesus Christ, I'm able to go to my Lord in those moments when I struggle and realize that I can enter into the throne room of grace and find forgiveness. The law gives us this. It points this to us points us to this. And the law is very simple. How is it summed up in the New Testament? Love the Lord your God and love your neighbor. You do those two things, you fulfill the law. It's not complex, but it requires a relationship, doesn't it? The third thing we see here is that the law is true. 
This is so important for us to understand. Because when we talk about true, and again, I want to go back here and I want to point this back to God. Perfection is his integrity. Pure is his morality. True is his trustworthiness. God is trustworthy. Stop and think for a moment in your life of someone that you trusted, you depended upon, and they let you down. For whatever reason, even if it wasn't unintentional. You know, you, 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 you counted on somebody to do something and they didn't follow through. Intentionally, unintentionally, for whatever reason. God always follows through. Sometimes we ask ourselves what, you know, how and when did he follow through? There are times in my life I say, God, you know, uh, I, you know, you, I know that I'm I can trust you. I know you're trustworthy. I know you're going to bring me through the situation, but could you just do it on a different timetable? You know? But that doesn't work his way. It's his timetable is not ours. Stop and just take a moment and look back at this past year. I challenge you this afternoon to reflect on, the, on last year. And let the Holy Spirit show you every time God proved his trustworthiness in your life. And you didn't even realize it. Because often we don't. Do we? He, he comes through. He's trustworthy. And we just move right along on to the next thing and just totally misses what he's done. You see, the righteousness of Scripture speak to us bringing awe and respect for its truth to all who accept it. But we have to accept the fact that this law, this word of God is trustworthy. I can, I can lean on everything that he reveals to me here as his. It's hard sometimes to look at scripture and read a passage and say, well, how does, how does this work out for God? Where is God in this or or something like that. And yet at the same time, we need to realize that God is in the whole of Scripture. You see, the law of God presents us with the truth of Scripture, the truth of God, the one who is incapable of lying and who desires a love relationship with us. That's the foundation. Why did God create us? To have a relationship. You know, back in the uh, ancient Near East, back in that time of, you know, when, when religions were developing all of their their, their deities and things like that. Many, if not all of the other, re other religions, the gods created humanity because they were bored and needed someone to do things for them. It wasn't about a relationship. It was more like indentured servitude. It was the idea that, you know what? Uh, we just, you know, let's do this. And, you know, let's make life miserable for them. Because why? Because we're bored and we can have fun. What a way to, what a God to serve. Huh? What a way to live. We even see this somewhat today. I will do these things for my God even though, if I, even though I don't know if it's going to get me to where I want to be for eternity. We serve a God who said, I am trustworthy and my word says that if you accept my son Jesus Christ as your Savior, you will. Jesus says you will be with me in heaven. Now we do other things. We serve. We 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 um, participate in in the things of the kingdom. We again we we feed the sick and and you know clothe the poor. Those things not out of obligation, not because it puts a you know another notch in our caps or or, or whatever so or in our belt so that we can make it to heaven. It's not like all of a sudden, you know, uh, I just, you know, if I do enough things, I'll get the golden ticket. The golden ticket is irrelevant here. We do things because of the one who we accepted and love who said, because of me, you're there. Jesus healed the sick. Jesus fed the hungry. The things he says, the things that I do, you will do. We do them out, not out of obligation, but out of love for who he is. 
And he said it again. Today he will be with me. This is so important for us to understand the truth of the law of God. He is trustworthy. If this word says it, we can accept it not as we want to reinterpret or tear apart, but as he presents it to us. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And yet I've heard ministers say, who am I to say that no one can enter? You're right. You're no one. I'm no one. I cannot tell you, but Jesus Christ can because it's his word. And I either accept it as perfect, pure, and truthful, which means it's absolute, or I reject it completely. There's no in-between. So what does this mean for all of us? As we begin the new year, let's just take to heart the perfect nature of God. Living by God's standard is not a burden. It's not a harsh responsibility. It's a privilege for each and every one of us. Have you ever thought about that? That your relationship with Jesus is a privilege? It's a privilege for those who love and trust him. And it depends, and we depend upon him for our strength. We depend upon him to bring us through. Uh, you know, over the past year, how many times have you spent on your face before God or, or, you know, just praying before God about a situation, about something that was going on, and, 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 and you just laid everything at his feet and said, God, I can't do this. This is impossible. I have to get this over to you. I can't do it on my own. Did you really trust him when you said that? The Apostle John in 1 John 5 puts it this way. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And I'll put this last part, and his commandments are not burdensome. Too often we think that just living for God is a burden. Burdens. I say we in a general sense, okay? Yeah, I get it. How many of us have spoken to someone and said, well, I don't want to go to church. It's just a bunch of do's and don'ts. I can't accept Jesus because it's a bunch of do's and don'ts. To accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and to serve him in obedience is not dictated or regulated by a strict adherence to the regulations of a law that takes away our freedom. We talk about freedom in Jesus Christ. We have that freedom. It's not the freedom to go on sinning, as Paul said, but the freedom to, to, to be free from the guilt of sin, the bondage that, that once held on to us. It's a life in which our relationship with Christ is grounded in our love for him. And his love for us, it goes both ways. We love him because he first loved us. We live and act according to that love and not out of obligation to some written code. So when I'm talking about the law here, okay, I, I'm not talking about a written code. As, as the prophet said, there will be a day when, when, when the law that was written on tablets of stone will be written on hearts of flesh. It's ingrained in us. Not a strict adherence to a code, but a relationship that's built on Jesus Christ. I, I walk in obedience. We walk in obedience to Christ because we love him and he loves us. The psalmist presents this point to us in showing the perfect nature of God's love which purifies our hearts and grounds our trust in him. Not in the world, not in the things of the world, not in ourselves, not in our family or co-workers or friends. While well, these are all important, none of them can save us. Only Jesus Christ is God and accomplishes that. 
must ground our trust in Him. If you have felt that living for God has been a burden, then look into the truth of His desire for a relationship with you. Again, John says it. His commandments are not burdensome. They're not. They only become a burden when we make them so. When I choose to do something out of what I believe to be my obligation, my requirement, and not out of my love relationship. Your obedience to his is not a birth, but a life of peace, tranquility, in which one places their full trust and confidence in him. Do you place your trust and confidence in Jesus Christ this morning? Have you allowed yourself the opportunity to um, live a life of peace, to live in tranquility? And that's not to say that, that you know, sometimes we think of peace and tranquility, we think that, man, everything's going to just run smooth, and that's not at all. You know, to me, peace and tranquility are who I am when everything around me is going crazy. If the world's the hurricane, Jesus is the eye of the storm. I can sit in the middle and look at everything that's going on around me and be in total peace. Everything's tranquil. And when that storm moves, he's there with me. What better way to start the new year than with a deeper love for the law and the word of God? Just the idea of the spending time, and that's my challenge. That's why we're we're doing this this Psalm one nineteen thing. I, I just when I was reading it uh, a couple weeks ago, and uh, and I was thinking about this, and I thought, Lord, I think if I broke this down, if we broke this down into twenty two weekdays it would be really cool if we could just do eight verses a day spend some time with it and I'm going to challenge you you don't just you know I remember eight verses ding you know clock's done reflect meditate pray study find something some, even check your study Bible or something. Find something that, just, that speaks and shares what these verses mean. And so I, I prayerfully considered this, and I thought, okay, Lord, I want to do it the first month of the year that has 22 weekdays. I'm giving you Friday, I'm giving you Saturday and Sunday off. Sunday for church, like I told my class this morning. How about on Saturday, you go back and read uh, the whole weeks. I mean, it's only 40 verses a week. Right? So, I went to the calendar and I looked, and guess what? 22 weekdays in January. I figured, God, you must be right here. I'm going to do this. Okay. I said 22. You gave me 22 right out the gate. So I'm going to try somehow to see if I can post this somewhere for those of you that are online that maybe want to follow along. I'll try to figure something out without destroying or crashing the internet. But those of you that are in house here, if you want one of these today, you can pick one up if you don't have one yet. Um, don't just read it. And I'm saying this about Psalm 119, but let me put it to you this way. Don't just read the word. Read a book. Meditate, pray, study the word. Take the time to let God speak to you through that word. It's his. It's not ours. It's his self-revelation to us, each and every one. So let's take time this year. And I'm going to be sharing some things about, really, I think, I'm still praying about this, but there are just some things I think today that the world is looking at as far as the word of God that um, I don't think it's what he intended for us. And I want us to have a new revelation, not a new personal revelation. I want God to reveal himself to us through the Holy Spirit. That this year will be a year of growth. We talk about growth in numbers. That would be wonderful. But you know what's more important than more people in the pews? 
more people devouring the Word of God. Getting to know who He is and what He wants to do for you. Let's pray. As we close our time together this morning, I just ask in Jesus' name that the Lord would speak to each and every one of us and give us that hunger, that desire for that perfect, pure, truthful law of God. That perfect, pure, and truthful word of God. That self-revelation of who he is and who we can be when we come to know and grow in him. One of the biggest issues that we deal with today, I think, within the church and those outside the church is the fact that we're dependent upon others to reveal God to us and not allowing God to do it himself. And that can only happen when we take the responsibility of going into his word, spending time in prayer, building our relationship with him, not letting others do it for us. So this morning, if if the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, whether here today or, or online, and, and the Spirit is saying, I want you to get deeper into this word, into this law, into a relationship, God is going to reveal himself to you in a fresh new way this year if you would just take the time to let him do it. This is his self-revelation. He wants to give it to you. Not as you want, but as he desires. Perfect pure, truthful. There is no other way. If that's what the Spirit is saying to you today, then I, I, I ask that you just let God begin to guide you and make this a part of your life. Not just stamping off today's reading. We can do that in 10 minutes. But studying and meditating on the Word, making time for Him, you know, you can do this if you shut down Facebook or TikTok for 20 minutes. And we spend more time on social media than we do in the Word of God, and yet this is the Word that saves. Father, I pray that it would be desire of each and every one that hears this Word to do so. And I ask, Lord God, that you would speak to hearts and lives. Let this year be a new and fresh year your word in our relationship. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you all. I pray that you have a really great week. And I want to thank you all for being here this morning. For those of you that are online. Also, don't forget that um, if you uh, want to give, you can do so online by donating through our church website or through your Faith Life page. If you have an offering, you can drop it off in the basket here this morning as well. And uh, we also have a text to give option if you want to do that. And the sermon we have later on our website and our Facebook page. So follow us on Facebook and uh, share this with someone else. And may God bless your week ahead. God bless you.